Good morning, everybody. Welcome back to Bible study. Some of my favorite words to say ever. Welcome back to Bible study. Here we are. Oh, we got one more coming in. Okay. So uh, we, we will need a Bible today. So if you have a Bible in front of you, great. Either an actual book or on your phone. We are going to be going through the Gospel of Mark in this study, and we'll talk about um, why we picked that, why we are picking a Gospel to go through, and specifically why I picked the Gospel according to Mark. And today we're going to uh, give an overview of the Gospel itself, who wrote it, why they wrote it, the themes that we'll come across as we study this book, um, and... Uh, then we'll dive right in, right into it in the very beginning. So before we do any of that, though, we have to begin at the very beginning and uh, ask a blessing upon our meeting today. Dear gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you that you sent your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, that we can truly call him the Son of God. And because he is your Son, that he is true God, he has authority and his word has authority. We pray for that word to come to us today, enlighten our minds and hearts, and to purify us and cleanse us with your sanctifying power. We ask all the blessings of your word to come to us as we study this gospel, this life of our Lord. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. All right, so I have a question for everybody. Why study the gospels? There you go. Good answer. Yeah. It's God's word. If it's God's word and he wrote it, revealed it, wrote it specifically for us, we should probably pay attention, right? That's the author of the heavens and the earth. That's our creator. And so if he has a will and a plan for our life and for the life of the world to come, probably a good idea to pay attention. What benefits does reading the gospel, do reading the gospels offer us? Well, this one for the book of Mark is very interesting because it tells he was baptized. And mm -hmm. when he got baptized, the heaven doors opened and the God, God said to him, you are my son who I'm well pleased. Yes, yeah. And then he also said, he baptized with water, but when, the Holy, when we get baptized, it's the Holy Spirit. Yes, yeah, yep. Yeah. So foreshadowing even then Pentecost, but then also the entire church of Pentecost, the New Testament church since and then. It also shows yes, it does. Very good. Yep. Yeah. Um, so Mark specifically, uh, w why we might study Mark is it's, uh, emphasizes the words and deeds of Jesus. All the Gospels show us the words and deeds of Jesus, but in, in particular, Mark shows us how the word of Jesus and the deeds of Jesus are inseparable. Um, you can't, unlike the rest of us human beings who are sinful and fallen, you can very often separate our words from our actions. With Jesus, the word is action. He is the word made flesh, as John uh, tells us, reveals to us. And so he has authority, he has power, and that power is in his word, his word of command, but also his word of promise as well, uh, his word of comfort. Uh, one commentator says, Jesus, in the Gospel of Mark, Jesus speaks and it is done. Uh, that, and that certainly reminds us of how God's word is powerful elsewhere in the word. God speaks and everything is created out of nothingness and void. Uh, Jesus speaks, it is finished, and it is finished. It is done. Um, we, uh, what, what blessings come from reading the Gospels in particular, as opposed to other types of books, other genres in the Bible? There's more love, not as much law. I don't know. I don't know about that. There's an awful lot of love in the Old Testament, yeah. too. And there's a lot of law in the Gospels. Uh, a lot of, Jesus uh, <laughs> can preach the law when he needs to. And Paul especially can preach, you know, the New Testament letters preach the law. 
Yeah, yep, and we see that in the Gospels, uh, that Jesus is not only referring to the Old Testament, he's actually fulfilling the Old Testament. He is living and being the prophecies of the Old Testament. Um, we see that more in Matthew than in Mark. But mm -hmm. I see also the, that, to me, it encourages trust. trust yeah. What he says. Yeah, absolutely. And, yeah, and serves as an example for us. Yeah. Two good points. I think it's a touchstone for our lives of faith, where we can, in the midst of our daily lives and this world around us, um, that we get, you know, can get lost in, we return to the source of our faith. Uh, we sort of shut out the rest of this world and we focus on heaven. Uh, and the Gospels in particular are where the life of heaven come directly to us and we read about, we receive the life of Jesus there. Uh, and then also the example that they give us. Um, one Good example of that from uh, the Gospels is uh, the Sermon on the Mount in the, the book of Matthew. This is Jesus speaking to his disciples, and he's giving them the example of the life of faith. This is not laws to please God or to earn his favor, but now that we have God's favor secured, this is how we are to live according to God's will. Uh, we see Jesus' example, first and foremost, um, of the Christ-like life. Uh, that we are given through faith, that we are to, to walk in all the days of our life. We also see the example of Jesus' disciples, which is a little different than Christ's example in the Gospels. Uh, we'll, we'll talk a bit about that before. But Any other benefits to reading the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John in particular? Well, I think the Old Testament pointed to Christ always and what he was going to do, and, and how, how he would do it, and so forth. Mm -hmm. And the New Testament, the Gospels, says, here he is. This is what he does. Yeah. He says this, he does this, and explains the Old Testament to us. Yeah, absolutely. This uh, Messiah, long-awaited Messiah, hundreds of years, thousands of years, if we go all the way back to the first promise of the Gospel in the Garden of Eden, uh, finally here, has appeared. Mark will really focus on that, uh, Jesus appearing. He is here, and he is doing things that he's supposed to do. Yeah. Uh, maybe I'm wrong on this, but the four Gospels, the writers of those, did they more or less, uh, well, we should say, be around Jesus all the time, and some of his early, early followers, I mean, eyewitnesses, mm -hmm. I guess. Yeah, um, so eyewitnesses, the, the apostles would have been in those three years of their apostleship under Jesus and discipleship, um, they would have, they were, so Jesus had more than 12 disciples. We talk about the 12 disciples as the core group, and they were the ones that followed Jesus around, that went with him, lived with him, helped him out. He had many other disciples of varying number throughout his ministry, sometimes a lot more, sometimes a lot less. Um, but uh, Mark, uh, we'll see Mark was not an apostle of Jesus. So all four of the Gospels are not um, accounts of, you know, uh, living and following and working with Jesus during his earthly ministry. Um, but they do uh, offer us still, even with Mark, uh, we'll see they offer us eyewitness testimony of who Jesus is and what he did for us. <laughs> So, uh, yeah, so that there is a, we can, through the Gospels, we have access directly to the life and work of Jesus in his earthly ministry. Mm -hmm. um, uh, another I image I want to leave with you in, in terms of uh, what Faith said about the Old Testament predicting Jesus and then Jesus fulfilling it is um, the image that uh, my, um, uh, one of my favorite professors in seminary, um, uh, the former seminary president, Galen Schmeling, he used this image a lot and it stuck in my head, is that the Old Testament is like, imagine that you're on a street corner and you are approaching the street corner from this angle and someone is walking towards you to meet you at the corner from this angle and the sun is at their back. So as you approach the corner, you can see their shadow on the sidewalk in front of you. You can't see them but you can see that someone is there and someone's getting closer 
right? You can see their outline and who they are generally, right? Their rough outline. That's the Old Testament. This is believers, this is the church, and this is Jesus, right? So the Old Testament is foreshadowing. We see the coming Messiah in uh, an outline. And, and we do have more than just a shadow. We have very specific details of the Savior provided to us in the prophecies of the Old Testament. But then once Jesus comes, is born, lives, uh, we meet at the corner. There he is in the flesh, right? Uh, so we see exactly who he is. We see him not just as a foreshadowing, but as the fulfillment, what he is meant to be. Um, and then that includes all of the prophecies, that includes all of the ceremonies, the rites, the priesthood, the civic law, everything having to do with temple worship, every single object in the temple, the layout of the temple, everything um, that would have been essential to Jewish life in the Old Testament, there it is, fulfilled in Jesus, right? Um, I, I came up with a, a brief list of why do we read the Gospels, um, and I, I want to share that with you. If you want to learn about Jesus, read the Gospels. If you want to know the Bible better, read the Gospels. The Gospels are the Bible, but they refer all, you know, to the Old Testament all over in the Bible. If you want a better prayer life, read the Gospels. If you need comfort, patience, guidance, read the Gospels. And if you don't think you need comfort, patience, or guidance, read the Gospels. <laughs> if you need uh, correction, if you need training, if you need humility, read the Gospels. And once again, if you don't think you need correction, training, or humility, read the Gospels. If you need strength to fight spiritual battles, to resist temptations, to be delivered from evil and the evil one, read the Gospels. If you are spiritually hungry or thirsty, read the Gospels. If you want to walk with Jesus, read the Gospels. That was just a, a few brief items that I found. And so uh, I think with, with these questions, it, it pretty much everybody that is alive, that has lived, that ever will live, has a reason to read the Gospels. Why read Mark in particular? Why, why look at Mark? Because um, I suggested it. Hey, there you go. Why read the Gospels? Because it's God's word. Why go through Mark? Because pastor said it. <laughs> I, when I stand at the podium, I do feel like a dictator. So, yeah, it's, <laughs> you must obey. Yes, buddy. That's debated. Yeah. Yeah. Possibly. We, we're not sure who wrote first, Matthew or Mark. And there are some people who think Luke wrote first. I don't, I don't think that. I tend to think Matthew wrote first. I, I talked a bit about this on, uh, at Bible class on Sunday too. I tend to think Matthew wrote first, but I, I think you could make an argument that Mark wrote first. I think, um, we'll talk about the origin of Mark's gospel, when and why he wrote it. And I think that's probably later than when Matthew first composed his gospel. Um, but he was uh, of, uh, uh, of the gospel writers, he was probably first or second um, out of the four. So, um, yeah, any other guesses? It kind of it shows God's power when he went and took the demons out of the... Yeah. It shows that he had that power and people were in awe of him. Who is this person? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, so it shows uh, God, God's power at work, his ability to accomplish what he says he will. It shows um, that question, who is this? Who is Jesus? Um, Mark, in particular, is concerned with that question. And he shows a lot of love for many sins. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yep. Yep, absolutely. That says here also he was the most detailed. So he... Really? Yeah. <laughs> the most detailed. The, the most detailed. Mm -hmm. Huh. I don't know about that. I wonder what they're talking about. What details they're talking about. Um, 
because it is, uh, as that said, it is the shortest, the shortest gospel. Uh, that's another reason I chose it, is I, I know my Bible classes tend to, to drag on uh, through seasons, and so I, I want it to be as efficient as possible with our time. Yes? What's really weird is you start looking stuff up on the internet and you can get all kinds of responses. Yeah. But in Wikipedia, they're talking about the Gospels. And again, they're the same Mark was first. Okay. But they said, despite the traditional descriptions, all four are anonymous. <laughs> oh, good. This, yes. scholars agree that none were written by eyewitnesses. Okay, that's excellent. Uh, that's a very good point. Um, where do I have, we're going to talk about that. I'm glad that was brought up. We, we're going to address that in a, in a minute. Yeah, yeah. So keep that in your mind that scholars claim that the Gospels were anonymous and they were not written by eyewitnesses of Jesus. Keep that in your mind. And then we're, we'll talk about it and then just get that garbage out of your mind because <laughs> I don't know who, it, uh, we'll talk about it. <laughs> it is not, it's not academic, it's not scholarly. Those claims are not, there's no evidence that supports those claims. I think if I'm correct on this, for Wikipedia, anybody can kind of start adding stuff. You know? Yeah. It doesn't have to be like, this is a group of people who actually researched it. Correct. Yep. You know, so, uh, yep. And I would say that's, it's actually probably accurate that the general consensus of scholars in America think the Gospels are anonymous and were not written by the, the people who wrote them, or, or at least not w written by eyewitnesses of Jesus. That, that is probably the general consensus of scholars. I, I'm going to get into this, don't worry, because I have no idea how that is a solid claim. I don't see any evidence that supports that. Uh, and um, I, it's not scholarly to make that claim. It's bad scholarship, as a matter of fact. Uh, but that just is what people have been taught and have been led to believe since the mid 1800s. That's the world. Yeah, it's true. Yep. It's looking for any excuse to discredit the, the Word of God. And the other, the other thing is, yeah. for your advice, salvation, we don't need to know who wrote first. Right. No, that's true. Yeah, if, absolutely. If, if that was important, it would have been recorded. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah, well, and uh, uh, another... That's the popularity. Yeah, yep. They, they would much rather go to the, the most immediate, most widespread source yeah. than the actual yeah, source we'll material. The other, thing, the other thing we'll look at is very few people actually go to the, the many, many, many writings of the early church, the early church fathers that we actually have, and they often ignore that evidence. Uh, and don't even consider it when we have a lot of evidence from those sources that indicates contrary to the claims of modern scholarship. And it's one of those things where it's like, here's what the people in the generation after Jesus, who the people who were taught by the apostles, here's what they said, and here's what people 1,800, 1,900, 2,000 years later say about it. Which one is going to be more accurate, just generally? Like... Closest to it. The closest to it, probably, yeah, right. That, that's probably a good just starting point for how we weigh the value of these pieces of evidence and these claims that are being made without evidence often. Um, yes, anyway, we'll, <laughs> we'll get back to that in one minute. Um, Mark is the shortest gospel. That's one of the reasons that I, I picked it. It's 16 chapters, um, and it, it just... Text-wise, it's also short. You, you can read it in one sitting if you have enough time. Um, it, it's, it's been performed in one sitting in about maybe hour and a half, two hours. Uh, readers will read the whole gospel from start to finish. There's an excellent version of this by a man named uh, David Suchet, S-U-C-H-E-T. He's a British actor. Uh, he is a Christian, and he reads the entire Gospel of Mark, gives a, uh, not, like, not dramatic reading, but uh, a powerful reading of the Gospel of Mark. Um, and there's a, the full YouTube video is a, uh, available of it. Um, very excellent reading. 
Um, but yeah, so the point is you, you could, if you have two hours, you could read it in one sitting. You could even read it out loud in one sitting. Um, Mark is fast paced. It's the shortest gospel and it's the most immediate. Uh, we'll see when we get into the first verses uh, today. Uh, it boom, 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 boom. It flies by. It goes from one event to the next. Uh, and that's where I wonder what details they're referring to when it's the most detailed because it tends to give uh, a, an image or a person or a scene and then it immediately moves on to the next. And that word you'll notice appear again and again, immediately. Immediately, that's one of Mark's favorite words. Uh, and that word appears more often in Mark than it does uh, in the other Gospels, maybe even in the New Testament. I don't know for sure about that. But Mark loves that word. Immediately, Jesus did this. Immediately, they went. And once again, it shows it's fast-paced. Right, Mark wants to get your attention and keep your attention. Uh, and so that makes it a very engaging gospel to go through in a Bible study. Someone like Matthew, which is a very long gospel reading, has, a, I think, a lot more detail, uh, especially regarding the prophecies that are fulfilled. Um, but, uh, uh, you know, if I were to go through Matthew, uh, we'd be done maybe by the time I retire. Uh, <laughs> I'm not sure. Uh, so I wanted to go through Mark. It's fast paced and it's short. Uh, and yeah, and Mark emphasizes, as I said, the words and deeds of Jesus, both of them together being inseparable. Um, Mark is one of what's called the synoptic gospels. Um, I'm going to write that down because we're going to look at that word. Has anyone heard this term before, synoptic gospels? Does anyone know what it means? Like synod. synod, ah, yes, actually, this is the same, synod, S-Y-N. That means with, together with. So synod, uh, the O-D part is the word for road or path. So synod means the same path, the same road. We're walking the same road together. So syn, optic, this means with or together with. Uh, any familiar words from optic? Eyes, eyes yeah, opt optrician, optics, right? These are optics, uh, eyes, eyesight. Uh, so it's seeing, it's sight, it's view. Uh, so it's the synoptic gospels are those with the same seeing, the same sight. Uh, the synoptic gospels are those that give the same general view of the life and work of Jesus. And they are Matthew, Mark, and Luke. So if you read these three gospels, you'll notice a lot of similarities between them. There's a lot of similar accounts and some of the same teachings, the same words that Jesus uses. Um, th these gospels is where we get the Lord's Prayer. Um, there's two versions of it, one in Matthew, one in Luke. That's not a contradiction. It just means Jesus taught that prayer on more than one occasion to more, more than one audience, which makes sense. He's teaching his disciples to pray. So generally speaking, these three gospels contain the, the uh, uh, similar view of Jesus. John, then, is sort of the odd duck. Uh, he is not synoptic. He does not have the same general view. Uh, does that mean John disagrees with Matthew, Mark, and Luke? No. Why not? Yeah, yeah, <laughs> absolutely, yep. Um, so how is John different? I don't know, but all the peace devotions, when then people talk, they tell you that if I'm going to tell you, if, if you're a new person, don't have nothing to do with the Bible, and I want you to start reading the Bible, you should start with John. I think that's good advice, yeah, yep. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. yeah. I think so, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I, I think John is both the, the easiest gospel for a modern audience to approach and also the most challenging, uh, which is just uh, shows the Holy Spirit's brilliance. 
that you can very easily understand everything that's going on in John and you can know exactly who Jesus is and what he's done. Uh, but yet there's, there's end, you could read it endlessly and still get more out of it and still have a lot to contemplate and meditate on and puzzle over. Um, so John is different, not that he's dissimilar or disagreeing. It's just by the time John writes, he, he's the last one to write a gospel that is inspired by God. So these three had already written their gospels. They were already widely distributed. They were being read. They were being taught in, um, in church uh, services. John comes along later, and so he's emphasizing different things about Jesus. Not, not that they're contradictory or not that they didn't happen, but it's uh, basically with these three Gospels going out and their truth, even at that early stage, there were starting to be false ideas about Jesus, false teachings uh, creeping in. And so John writes his Gospel to address those false ideas. Uh, so he provides more information, more detailed information in certain areas. And he also provides accounts from Jesus' life. He was an apostle, an eyewitness, uh, that the other gospel writers did not write, uh, did not write about. And so John has this great line at the end of his gospel that says, if you were to record everything that Jesus did, the world would not have enough bookshelves to record them all. That's great. Like So we know that all of the Gospels, the information we do have about Jesus, it's everything we need to know to be saved, but it's still just a very limited amount of what Jesus, everything Jesus did. Uh, but we have uh, more than enough to, to, for our eternal salvation and our security in that. Uh, so Mark is one of the synoptic Gospels. We'll see there's a lot of overlap between him and Matthew, and that's why there's a kind of debate about which came first. Um, but the, as Ken said, the, the, the point is not which came first. The point is we have them. <laughs> we have them both. Uh, yeah. Um, also, intended audience is different for all of these writers. So the way that they write their Gospels will be different. They'll, they'll address different issues. They'll address different uh, events from the life of Jesus based on their audience doesn't mean they're contradictory or wrong. Uh, it just means there's different people that hear about the gospel in different ways, uh, which we know from Scripture. Uh, uh, Paul adjusts his teaching based on his audience. We know just from real life example, too, and experience. So um, who wrote the book of Mark? Mark, yes, John Mark, also called John Mark, but Mark wrote the book of Mark. Yes, very good. That is the question that uh, we've already talked about a bit, and it seems very difficult for scholars today to answer. Uh, a very simple question, <laughs> who wrote the Gospel of Mark? Um, there is this theory called the anonymous Gospels theory. It is highly prevalent today. Many mainstream scholars profess this. Uh, that the Gospels were first anonymous. There was no name attached to them. Um, and this is probably, if you go to, uh, if you go to public university and they still tell you anything about the Bible, they will probably tell you the Gospels were anonymous. Even if you go to private, uh, Christian universities, they might tell you that the, they might, because they might have been influenced by this modern scholarship. And they might tell you that the Gospel manuscripts and the Gospels were originally anonymous. Um, that's very unfortunate. Uh, how many, of all of the manuscripts of the Gospels that we have, how many do you think are anonymous, have no attribution to them? I wouldn't think of. Yeah, I would say there's too much. I think there's Zero. There are zero manuscripts of the Gospels that are anonymous. I don't know where, this is why I say I don't know where this claim came from. I don't know why so many people profess it as scholarship, because there is absolutely no textual evidence that this is true. Uh, every single copy of the Gospels that would, you know, either the first page or the last page where that contains the first or last page where attribution was given, every single one, it's attributed to Matthew, Mark, Luke, or John. Uh, and uh, 
um, uh, yeah, so every single one where attribution would be given, we have, the we have attribution. Another point is that there's no misattribution in any of the manuscripts. Matthew's gospel is never attributed to Mark or Luke or John uh, or any other, anybody else. Matthew is always Matthew, Mark is always Mark, Luke is always Luke, John is always John. Uh, if they were anonymous, you would expect at least some misattribution as they're trying to figure it out and as you know, different people want to attribute it to different people, right? Different groups want to say, no, it was so-and-so that wrote this gospel, not, it was Mark that wrote this and not Matthew. So there are absolutely no anonymous texts and every single one is attributed to who it's attributed to. There's no uh, changeover between them. Uh, yeah. Yeah. So they want to they want to argue that the gospels were written much later than they probably were. And once again, they ignore the evidence we have from the early church fathers. Um, they want to remove the writing of the gospels as far away from Jesus as possible, and they they want to make the claim that. Um, they, they were not recorded by eyewitnesses of Jesus. They were recorded by later disciples who then used the disciples' names to gain credibility. Right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So they say, um, like, uh, it, it would be like in maybe 150 AD, they would say, we're going to write this life of Jesus to promote our agenda, and we're going to put Matthew's name on it to give it credibility. Right? A problem with that is if you're going to give your gospel credibility, why choose Matthew? Uh, he was a tax collector. He was scum. Uh, why choose, uh, um, well, why choose Mark? Uh, we're going to talk about that too. Uh, Mark was not even a disciple, an apostle of Jesus. Why not choose Peter? <laughs> you know? Don't you think that Satan's seed of doubt way back? Yeah. In 1968, I had a Western Civilization professor mm -hmm. say the Bible is nothing more than a compilation of fairy tales. That's an, that's an invention of the mid-1800s. That's where that idea comes from. <laughs> yep. And once again, I say, um, if your teaching about these documents comes 1,850 years after the fact, Maybe there's better, more reliable sources you can go to in order to understand what these documents are and how they were used. Um, but yeah, it, it, yeah it, it comes from the Germans, those Germans. What's it? It was a gut punch. Yeah, oh yeah. Basically, Pastor, that you know, the church we left taught that. Yeah, yep. I mean, they might have just as well said it's a book of fairy tales. Yeah. There were a couple professors in Germany that really came up with this idea and popularized it, um, especially about the Old Testament. Um, and then it just, it really caught on in Europe and then it was brought to America and it, that is what that's being taught, that's what's being taught. Mainstream, uh, universities, seminaries, things like that. So I think the minority of pastors these days would believe and confess what we believe, what, what the early church wrote and recorded for us and believed and confessed. Along with Ken, and maybe some of you have heard me say this, but when we were at the Old Grace in our adult Sunday school class, we had a professor come from Capital University who mm -hmm. was teaching pastors. I asked the question because we were done with things, and I yeah. said, what about the miracles of the Bible? And this man said to our class, well, the story of Jonah and the big fish if I was down in there with the camera and took a picture, I could believe it. Other than that, he said, no, they're just good stories. Yeah, but you know what? Pictures can be faked. I don't think he would believe it. Uh, as Jesus says, even if... Even, yeah. As Jesus says, even if someone was raised from the dead, still they would not believe. Uh, I've heard that claim about Jesus' resurrection. Yeah. They, they're not yeah. I mean, I'm not 
Yeah, oh, the, my favorite one, my fa- my mo- in that I laugh at it the most, is that um, Jesus didn't actually feed 5,000 men plus women and children, is that uh, he asked for whatever food they had, and only this innocent little child offered his food. And then once people saw that act of generosity, they brought out the food they were hiding, and they all shared it with each other. <laughs> it's like, come on, if... If I was five years old, I'd roll my eyes at that. I mean, <laughs> uh, that authors, when they write something, they want to uh, know that I wrote this. This is how I see it, mm-hmm. and that's what I think about the the um, apostles here. When they wrote this, it's they they want you to know this is the way I saw it, but still the Holy Spirit was moving them mm-hmm. to write in this fashion. Yeah, yep. Mm-hmm. Yep, they absolutely. Their name to it. Yeah. This is the way Mark saw it. This is the way Matthew saw it. Yeah, yep. And one of the ways that we can um, trace the Gospels back to actually being written in the um, 40s, 50s, 60s, and then John later on, probably in the 80s, um, is there both by understanding their author and that there are actually historic documents uh, of the early church that attribute, that say, yes, Matthew wrote Matthew, Mark Luke, wrote Mark, Luke wrote Luke. Uh, so we actually have historic evidence for that. Um, but also the occasion why they were writing, who they were writing to, because those that's very specific to certain times and certain places. Uh, we'll see that with Mark in particular. We can really pinpoint uh, almost precisely when he must have first wrote his gospel uh, because of what we know about him in scripture, but then also historic events going on at the time as well. Um, what do we know about Mark, John Mark? We know his name. We do, yeah, <laughs> we do. That's more than a lot of people do. <laughs> serial number. Yep, yeah, right, yeah, Na- name rank serial number, right? <laughs> well, I think he went with Paul and Barnabas for a while, but then yeah. he, he deserted them. I, I don't know if that's the right word, but he mm-hmm. left them. Certainly Paul viewed it that way as a desertion, yeah. And Paul was very upset. Yep. So he, he joined Paul and Barnabas on their first missionary trip. Um, in, in the course of that, he left, and he, uh, I believe he went back home. We don't know exactly why. But uh, Paul did not like that. He viewed it as an abandonment. Um, and so when they were preparing their second missionary trip, Barnabas wanted Mark to come along, sort of give him another chance. But Paul said no. Uh, and so... Yeah, well, I would say conflict, certainly conflict, differences of opinion in the early church, which is good. It's healthy for us to see that in Scripture, that even the, even the Apostle Paul and the, those around him had conflict. They, they didn't agree. They didn't see eye to eye on what should be done. Uh, and so I don't think we should get frustrated when that happens in churches. Uh, we will all have differences of opinion. We'll, have, we'll, have, we'll each have different reasons for what we think we should do, and they will be very good reasons, right? It's not that one reason might be better than another. It's just we don't know. We have certain information, but there's a lot we don't know. Um, however, uh, it actually was a blessing. This, this conflict was a blessing to Christ's church because then instead of going on one second mission trip, they went on two. Uh, Bar- Barnabas took Mark and they went on a separate mission trip and then the book of Acts follows Paul on his second missionary trip. Don't you think Paul was a really strong personality? Yes, <laughs> he was. We certainly get that impression, yeah. <laughs> yep. Um, and certainly with Paul's own life experience, um, having that personal eyewitness, uh, Jesus appeared to him personally in such a dramatic way and to have such a 180 for his life to throw away all his previous life and go completely the opposite direction and dedicate his whole life to this path, I could see how he would be less merciful to someone who might, yeah, right, who might, yeah, not, not share that same zeal, as you say, yeah, or that same, like, undivided purpose, 
Uh, you know. However, we also have more good news is that eventually Paul and Mark did reconcile. And in fact, Mark visited, visits Paul when he's uh, when, during one of his periods of imprisonment. And at that time, Paul uh, actually says that Mark is very useful for the ministry. He's useful to me for the ministry. So it's not all bad news. People tend to uh, emphasize that division that happens without realizing the benefits that come from it. And, and yeah, right. And the reconciliation that occurs. Uh, so we know that Barnabas stuck up for Mark because they were cousins. They were family. He was a cousin of Barnabas. Mark uh, was Jewish. His mother was named Mary. She lived in Jerusalem. So Mark was in Jerusalem around the time of Jesus. He was younger. Um, he was probably in his 20s during Jesus' ministry. Um, let's see, what else do we know about him? Falling out, they reconciled. Oh, church tradition has long held that in, there's an account we get only in Mark. And it's only two verses in the book of Mark. In the Garden of Gethsemane, when Jesus is arrested, there is this young man who's following Jesus, following the disciples that are there. And they try to arrest this young man as well. They seize him, but he leaves his garment in their hands and he flees. He runs away naked into the night. We're given that detail. Uh, Mark is the only one that mentions this person. And for that reason, uh, it's been a longstanding tradition in the church that that young man is Mark himself, John Mark, uh, who was not an official apostle of Jesus, but was sort of tailing along nearby him. Uh, with the rest, with the other disciples, he got scared when Jesus was arrested and they tried to get him too, but he ran away. He was so terrified that he, he slipped out of his garment, uh, I guess leaving it in their hands probably, and then ran away naked into the night. Um, that could be, yeah, yeah, I'm, I, it might be, yeah. <laughs> in that sense, he is more detailed, yeah. <laughs> uh, we don't know, I, I don't think we know that 100% that that's who that is, but I, I think it's, it's likely that, that that probably is the case. Um, and then uh, we know that from uh, one of Peter's letters, we know that uh, not only was Mark, did Mark work with Paul, he also worked with Peter firsthand. And when Peter is in Rome, um, uh, Mark is there with him, helping him. From 1 Peter chapter 5, we get this, uh, this reference. And uh, <clears throat> that... Uh, that com uh, combined with the early church teaching about Mark and what, what those historians say, uh, Mark is associated with the regions of Italy and particularly the Church of Rome. Um, and so that also leads us to why Mark wrote his gospel and who he wrote it for. Uh, as we said, all of the gospels have different audiences and different reasons why the gospel is being written. They all share the reason that... Um, uh, what John says at the end of his gospel, these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God. Uh, but they have, each gospel writer has different pur immediate purposes as well. Um, it, uh, it appears that, so Mark was with the apostle Peter, we know that. Uh, early church history has that Mark was P one of Peter's interpreters, translators, uh, or maybe like a, a secretary of sorts. And so from very early on, uh, we have, uh, this, this is about 130 AD. Um, we have uh, evidence that Mark wrote his gospel in order to compile the teachings of Peter into one book. Uh, and specifically what Peter said and taught about the life and work of Jesus. So Mark himself is not an eyewitness apostle, but he works very closely with Peter, an eyewitness apostle. So what we have in Mark is very likely what, what Peter taught and what Peter said about Jesus as he visited different churches. Um, this, this actually has some evidence in scripture because in Acts 10, uh, does anyone know about Peter's vision of the, the sheet descending from heaven? 
Uh, so Peter is sort of struggling with circumcision, Jewish purity, and then the, the Gentiles. And like he, he really struggles at times with, do you need to be circumcised to be saved or not? Um, and so Peter gets, as he's praying, he gets this vision of a sheet descending from heaven and it has all sorts of different animals, all kinds of animals, clean and unclean. And a voice from heaven says, uh, basically, kill and eat. Uh, this is all clean. There is no more clean or unclean, for everything is clean in Christ Jesus. Uh, and at that moment, um, there's a man named Cornelius that uh, is a uh, Gentile that contacts him uh, asking for his teaching. And so uh, Peter travels to Joppa to uh, visit with a number of Gentiles there. And so it's like this uh, God is giving him a sign, right? Like, don't just go to the, the Jews, go to the Gentiles, because all are one in Christ. And then he's immediately given the opportunity to preach Jesus to a Gentile audience. And his sermon in Acts chapter 10 uh, is pretty much the outline of the book of Mark. Uh, if you read Peter's sermon, that, that's pretty much how Mark's, it, Mark's gospel is arranged, beginning with Jesus' baptism and then ending with the baptism of believers, following that in Jesus' life and death and resurrection. Uh, so that's a good indication that Mark was actually uh, recording things, sermons, teachings that Peter was giving about Jesus, uh, and then sharing them with the church. That's also why um, it's indicated in the early church records that Mark was not trying to set out a like chronological, well-organized a, B, C, D account of the life of Jesus. He is just sort of compiling Peter's teachings uh, either as he hears them or as he remembers them. So that's why um, even though the Gospel of Mark has a, a good unity from beginning to end, it, it's not exactly chronological in its order. Um, so uh, yeah, just some interesting ideas about that. Um, we can, I think we can pretty confidently say that Mark was Peter's scribe, his interpreter, his translator, and that his gospel was recorded because he wanted to uh, share with the church what, what Peter had said and taught about Jesus. Um, another argument for how we can, th this does not prove that Mark wrote the gospel, but it's a good indicator, is if the gospel of Mark is anonymous, or if it is a forgery that someone tried to write in Mark's name, why attach John Mark's name to it? Why not Peter? Considering how, Mar how Mark was so closely associated with Peter and it seems to follow Peter's outline of preaching, why not Simon Peter, the, the head of the inner circle of the disciples? Why someone who was not even an apostle, John Mark? So that's a good indicator that it, it is who the church claims it is uh, when, they, when they say Mark wrote it. Uh, Mark was likely written in the mid-60s, um, and it is either, this is where we have disagreement in two of our sources from the early church. One source says that Mark wrote it uh, after Peter's death in order to share Peter's teachings, which was in probably 66, the year 66. Um, uh, he was crucified uh, by the Romans. And uh, very famously, they wanted to crucify him normally. And he said, no, I refuse to die in the same fashion as our Lord, as my Lord. And so they, he was crucified upside down. Uh, and so if you see an upside down cross, that's not a satanic symbol. That's a symbol of, of Peter <laughs> originally. Uh, it is used as a satanic symbol, right? It's an inversion of the cross, right? But... Um, in like all these horror movies you see, like there's a, it's a cliche now, there's a cross on the wall and then by some unknown force it whoa, flips around, ooh, scary. Ooh, the apostle Peter, oh no, terrifying. Um, there's also a tradition that says, uh, and documents that say it was written while Peter was still alive, which would make it probably about 64 to 66, um, the year 64 to 66. Uh, and that it, it's indicated that Peter himself read what Mark wrote and then sanctioned it. Uh, said, yes, this is, this is good, right? This is kosher, as Peter might say. Um, 
uh, but uh, I, I tend to fall into that camp that he, he wrote it probably 64 to 66 uh, within there. Um, I, once more, I want to say the idea that this gospel is anonymous, get out of your head now, because uh, there's no evidence for that whatsoever. Uh, for a number of reasons, we can be very confident Mark wrote the gospel of Mark and that he was a companion of Paul and Peter, and that this is very likely comes from Peter uh, first, firsthand. Uh, Mark's audience is specifically Gentile readers, something different than Matthew. Matthew was written for Jewish audiences who were familiar with the Old Testament scriptures. Mark, as we said, was in the, in the Italian regions uh, connected to Rome, the Christian church in Rome. And so we think it was written first and foremost for the Christians in Rome. And in particular, well, we know that because Mark explains Jewish customs if it was a Jewish audience, they wouldn't need it, that explanation. Mark translates Aramaic words. A Jewish audience would have known the Aramaic words. And he, Mark has a special interest in his gospel of persecution, suffering, and martyrdom. Um, in particular, how Christ is the one who suffered and was persecuted and was killed. And that was of particular interest in the Roman church because of the intense persecutions that the Roman government and the emperor in particular uh, enacted on the, the church in Rome. Um, does anyone know the, the emperor on, that executed Peter and Paul, that persecuted the Christians in the mid-60s? Probably the most famous emperor of Rome. Yes, Nero. Woo. I mean, he was out there. He was... <laughs> He tried to kill his own mother because he was afraid she was taking his power. He tried to drown her. He rigged this boat to sink, and it didn't work. She swam to shore. <laughs> <So>, uh, <laughs> uh, everything you heard about Nero is probably true and more, except the fact, or except for the idea that he fiddled while Rome burned. Um, that that probably was not true. Um, the, I don't think the fiddle was invented yet <laughs> at that time. And uh, it, it's just unlikely that that actually happened. That, that was probably a, a, a myth that, or a story that was added later. Could have happened, though. Um, but yeah, Nero was terrible. After the, the great fire in Rome, he blamed the Christians for starting it. And even though they were this small kind of, uh, they were thought of as this cult, this Jewish cult. Um, in Rome. And that was what sort of started the persecution of the Roman Christians at that time. Uh, even though it's most likely Nero himself started the fire. Um, so as for the Christians, we didn't start the fire. It was always burning since the world been, the world's been turning. But no? Any, okay, good. <laughs> uh, is that Billy Joel? Okay, yeah. <laughs> We didn't start the fire. It's most likely Nero himself did because he wanted to, uh, he had this building plan for the city of Rome and the only way he could make it happen was if like half the city was destroyed. So he was, uh, in order to rebuild Rome in his image, he uh, burned the city down and uh, then he built uh, luxury pavilions uh, and, and a, a lake, a man-made lake on, on top of the ashes. But the Christians received the blame. They were persecuted. They were thrown to the lions. Nero had them soaked in tar and affixed to pole, poles. And he, uh, in, when he had garden parties, he put them on a pole and he lit them on fire so they would be the lanterns for his garden parties. Um, yeah, uh, the more I hear about Nero, the more I just don't like him. Uh, <laughs> so... Yes, exactly. So the reason that Mark writes his gospel to the Christians in Rome in the mid-60s is to prepare them for the persecution, the suffering, the trials, the martyrdom that would await them, that is sometimes necessary for professing faith in Christ. Um, and he would have likely seen firsthand this persecution. Uh, and, uh, well, he did see firsthand because his... Uh, his teacher, Peter, was himself martyred, executed. Paul was beheaded because he was a Roman citizen, so they couldn't crucify him. 
He died a Roman's death, you know, a man's death, getting your head cut off. Uh, he, so he, Mark likely prepared his readers for persecution and suffering, which is why these themes of persecution and suffering for Christ appear again and again. Another theme he has is uh, hard-heartedness and fear. So we see the example of Jesus being the perfect sufferer in John's go- or Mark's gospel. We also see the example of his disciples being very poor sufferers, being afraid. Uh, that's in fact how his gospel ends. Um, we'll talk about the ending because it there's some wonky things going on with it. Uh, but uh, the the gospel ends with the women at the tomb. The tomb is empty. They're afraid and they run back. Uh, and that that is how we think the original ending of Mark ended. There's no appearance of Jesus after the resurrection. He's resurrected, and then it ends with the women's fear. Um, we see. Jesus frequently describing um, hard-heartedness in response to the gospel, in response to Jesus. Uh, We see the most negative portrayal of Christ's disciples out of all the gospels. We we have um, the the disciples failing to understand what Jesus is doing and what he's teaching. Uh, And so we have this sort of contrast uh, that in Mark's emphasis on suffering, you have Christ, the perfect example, but then you also have the flaws, the weaknesses of Christ's disciples. So we think that this is intended as encouragement in, to remain steadfast in the faith despite persecution. Um, a big theme of Mark is Jesus is the son of God. That's a title that is uh, attached to Jesus here. Uh, he is the son of God. This, and throughout, uh, we, this title is repeated. Jesus is the Son of God. We'll get it right away in Mark 1, verse 1. Jesus, the Son of God. It, it is brought to a head. It climaxes at the very end of the gospel at Jesus' cross. Does anyone remember who, says, who calls Jesus the Son of God at his cross? Roman centurion, right? Yeah, who says, truly this man was the Son of God. Once again, suffering of the cross, but then a Gentile recognizing, a Roman Gentile recognizing that Jesus is truly the Son of God, right? So we have a lot of these themes sort of coming together. That's sort of the high point, the climax of Mark's gospel. Truly this man was the Son of God. Um, Jesus as the Son of God has God's authority. And this ties back to Jesus' words and actions are the same thing. Uh, when he says something, it happens. His disciples respond to his authority, even though they don't <laughs> understand Jesus a lot of the times. Demons react to it. They are terrified of it, Jesus being the Son of God. Uh, creation itself obeys him. We have miracle accounts from Mark. In particular, two accounts of Jesus walking on water that will be uh, especially meaningful for uh, Mark's audience. We'll go through those. Creation itself obeys the Son of Man. But also we see Jesus as true man as well. Uh, he has a need for quiet prayer to get away from people. Uh, he has feelings of compassion for humans. He has feelings of anger, frustration, at hard-heartedness. He has a need for sleep, uh, which God, true, you know, God does not sleep. But Jesus, in his human flesh, according to his human nature, needs sleep. He seems uh, weak. He seems ineffectual at times. Uh, And so Jesus is not just all-powerful God and Son of God. He is truly human as well. Uh, And that makes him incredibly relatable to us. He's not just this high standard that we can never reach. He's God who has compassion, who reaches down to us and becomes one of us. Um, Because he's writing to a Gentile audience, Mark is focused on clean cleanliness and unclean. And he uh, has situations and and accounts from Jesus' life that talk about clean and unclean. He's trying to explain this concept to a Gentile audience unfamiliar with it. Uh, So Jesus makes a leper clean when he heals him, uh, which he does, ceremonially clean. A demon is, in Mark's gospel, is called an unclean spirit. 
Uh, a herd of swine, are, a demon is sent into a herd of swine and they're sent off the edge of a cliff, they're wiped out. Pigs are unclean animals, right? So there's this association with sin, evil, wickedness, with un- being unclean, and then Jesus as the one who purifies, the only source for cleanliness. Uh, And then another interesting component, and unfortunately we're going to have to end here, and we just got to 1 verse 1. We're going to get through it tomorrow, or next week, is the the last interesting component of Mark's gospel is secrecy. Jesus frequently telling people, his disciples, uh, demons, to not talk about him, to keep things secret. And we will talk about various reasons why he does that. It seems counterintuitive to us that we would think the good news of Jesus, forgiveness of sins, everlasting life for all through faith in him, uh, that should be proclaimed far and wide. But yet we see it in Jesus's, at times in Jesus's ministry, he, is, uh, he emphasizes, don't tell anybody about this. Um, and for that, we will leave Mark 1.1 1, 1 as a secret until next week when we will meet again. So if you'd like to get ahead, we are hopefully going to make it through Mark 1, verses 1 through 12 next week. I hope. Uh, As you'll see, there's a lot to unpack. Mark goes boom, 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 and doesn't leave a lot of time to breathe in these verses. And so we, we do need to take some time to figure out what Mark is talking about. But with that, uh, I do have to get going. I have a previous appointment, so let's bow our heads together in prayer. Dear gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you for your servant, John Mark, who served you and served the gospel in his ministry here on earth. We thank you that by your Holy Spirit, he recorded your word about the life of Jesus, the life we have in Jesus, in his gospel. And we thank you that by this word, we too have forgiveness of sins and everlasting life. We pray that over the course of this study, you would use this word to strengthen our faith and trust in you, to help us endure uh, suffering and persecution, to recognize Jesus as your true son, as true God in human flesh. And, uh, And also that Jesus' life and death and resurrection, that his will and his ways would not be kept secret from us, but that your Holy Spirit would enlighten us in your truth to the glory of your name and the salvation of our souls. In Jesus' name we pray these things. Amen. All right, thank you, everybody. Have a good week.